Today on the Run to the Top podcast. Pick a point in the race where you decide, okay, now the people around me at this point, those are the people I'm racing. Okay. And if I beat all the people around me or that person in front of me right now, that's me winning the race. Okay. So like I creating like a race inside where you are, like at some point in the race, as opposed to thinking about the people who are winning the race. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Sinead Hockey. Hi everyone, this is Sinead here with you for this latest episode of Run to the Top, brought to you by Runners Connect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Whether you're listening to this on your run or maybe during your commute, I hope you're having a great day and that you enjoy this podcast. Last week, we heard from Dr. David Geyer, orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, and author of That's Gotta Hurt, a book on the history of injuries and how sports medicine has evolved to better accommodate runners. Dr. Geyer discussed everything from injury prevention to the treatments available today that actually work to reverse damage done by past injuries. I learned a ton during this interview, and I think you will too, so if you missed it, be sure to check it out. This week, we're actually speaking with my good friend and professional runner, Esther Atkins. Like myself, Esther and her husband, Cole Atkins, ran for Zat Fitness and Reebok, and we met while training up in Blowing Rock, North Carolina together. Esther now runs for Skechers, and she's got a pretty lengthy list of achievements to her name. Her PR in the marathon is 2.33, and she was the USA marathon champion just three years ago. This last April, she placed 13th at the Boston Marathon, and I know she's got some pretty big plans for the fall. I have been so lucky to get to know Esther these past two years, And I can always count on her for some great perspective on enjoying the process, setting and working towards your goals, and even avoiding the pitfalls of comparison. Let's just say she and I have had some pretty lengthy runs together, and I am always reluctant to hit the stopwatch at the end. I'm so excited for her to share her experience and insight with you today. So after a quick break to thank our sponsors, we'll be right back with our interview. I want to give a big thanks to Body Health for sponsoring Run to the Top and for giving us Perfect Amino. These eight essential amino acids are the building blocks of protein that my body needs to train harder and recover faster. You can enter to win a pack of six Perfect Amino bottles for free by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Thank you so much to Pacific Health Labs for sponsoring Run to the Top and for giving our listeners free samples of their all-natural Excel gels. Learn more on how to get your free samples at the end of this episode and check out Pacific Health Labs at runnersconnect.net forward slash Pacific Health. Esther, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate you coming on the show to speak with us. So first off, can you just tell us a little bit about your background and how you first got into running? So um, I I guess I was always like my, my older sisters. I have two older sisters. Um, and they were both runners, um, my middle sister very briefly and my oldest sister quite seriously. Um, and she was actually a cross country captain and stuff. And I remember growing up, going to her cross country meets and watching them run and thinking to myself, man, I could run so much faster than that. You know, like when you're watching a long distance race, it doesn't look like, especially high schoolers, you know, it's not too impressive. they're not that good. And, you know. <laughs> Um, but they are also working really hard and you think to yourself, oh man, like I could run really fast, but you're also thinking like, maybe I could run really fast for like a hundred meters, but you don't understand, you don't comprehend how yeah. long the race actually yeah. is. <laughs> don't so, quite have the respect for the sport. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have a full respect for it. So I did grow up watching that. And then, you know, being this younger sister of a mm-hmm. cross country runner, I had some pride when it came to the like timed mile and always came in either first or second in my class and then I my family though is really musical and we really didn't have time for after school sports once I went to public school middle school and high school and after 
I was like spotted in gym class and my gym teacher saw that like I was taking my three minutes of jogging very, very seriously. <laughs> I would like, we would jog around the gym, cl- like the, the actual gym indoors and I got bored. So I decided to find out how many laps I could do in three minutes. And I think it got up to like 20. <laughs> That's impressive. I want right. to say, uh, and that was like, that became my benchmark uh, that I wanted to do every time. But he ended up kind of telling me I should go out for track. And I, I did do two seasons of outdoor track in um, middle school in seventh and eighth grade. And um, I did the mile the first season. I think I ran like 620. And then That's pretty decent. the second yeah. season I did the 800. I think I ran like 240 or something. Okay. You know, like, yeah. whatever. <laughs> um and then I, but I was fairly successful, you know, on middle school level. But when it came to high school, I was like really focused on my music and didn't think I had time for, and our, our track and cross country program at Maggie Walker Governor School in Richmond was um, really a very serious program with a really serious coach. And um, I was kind of intimidated. So I decided not to run um, because I also knew that I wanted to go abroad for my junior year. I didn't want to you know, feel so obligated and kind of um, tied into the team and the coach that I would end up not um, going abroad, which was something I'd wanted to do since I was in kindergarten because we had a foreign exchange student, not because I was just like this (laughs) super worldly five-year-old, you know. Um, So I ended up going going abroad my junior year and uh, being in Germany and it was a incredibly formative experience. I couldn't trade it for anything, but at the same time, uh, it was one of the most challenging things I've ever done. And part of the challenge was, you know, speaking a foreign language and thinking in a foreign language all the time, which um, combined with the changes in diet uh, <laughs> caused me to gain about 20 pounds. Um, and I ended up telling myself in February that after like a good long carnival weekend <laughs> um, that I was not allowed to shower unless I went for a run. And that got me started, got me out the door, good motivator there. And then I ended up uh, running about four or five days a week. <laughs> um, it's funny how it snowballs like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So then I, um, you know, I was a little stinky on those other days and I ended up uh, really becoming, I ran the exact same route every day and I became really competitive with myself. And Mm. it's funny because I've gone back and looked, I think it was like, I don't know, less than four miles, somewhere around three and a half miles that I used to run every day. And maybe even less than that. It might have been just three miles. But I just remember, you know, initially I really wanted to break 30 minutes and I think I one day I finally broke 27 minutes and I was just like over the moon. <laughs> and it's just interesting how, you know, that was really clear to me then that, you know, looking back especially, mm-hmm. that like I was more competitive with myself than mm-hmm. I was with anybody else. That had nothing to do with anybody else. I merely wanted to lose the 20 pounds that I had put on while I had been there and It turned out that I fell in love with self-improvement through the sport of running. Yeah. Well, I think most people do. I think that's the key to success in our sport. So I think it's it's funny that your gym teacher recruited you. I have the exact same story. I think Mm -hmm. that's that's kind of a classic story there. Uh, Yeah. When people are spotted in middle school. But oh my gosh, yeah, middle school teachers. If you're listening to this, you you need to like make (laughs) sure that you just spread the word. Yep. You see people getting competitive in the gym warm-up, that's, exactly. that's usually a good sign. Especially kids who are terrible at ball sports. Oh, yeah, yeah that too. That no hand-eye mean. coordination. Yeah. Yeah, right there no right hand-eye there. coordination, but clear athleticism. Then exactly. Send them to track and field. <laughs> <laughs> so, Esther, you, you had kind of this classic introduction to running, and you went on to have a very successful college career as well. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how it evolved into a career in marathoning? Sure. So uh, after I got back from Germany, I still wasn't convinced that I was an athlete. I wasn't really something that, even though my sister had been a runner, um, it wasn't really something that my parents really did around me much. And um, I didn't have a whole lot of examples. And I was still hesitant to join the team. So the fall, I did not do cross country my senior year, which, yeah, I had never done cross country at all. And, um, And then during the fall season, I was like, 
starting to dabble with like 800 meters of quote unquote cardio. And my high school coach then approached me finally, this guy who's like, you know, has tons of respect. He'd been coaching since my dad was in high school. And like, you know, he didn't need to spend it, waste any time on somebody who is like going to be nobody. And he walked up to me and said, you know, Esther, you know, are you interested in running track? <laughs> Cause he knew about me in middle school. Cause <laughs> my like slight foray, you know, like slight, little bit of uh, success there. Mm -hmm. And he ended up coming up to me and asking me if I wanted to do it. And I was like, well, I've got these other obligations, but I'll think about it. Um, and I ended up, for some reason, not doing orchestra that year. And, like, things kind of opened up. So I only had one day a week where I couldn't come to practice. And, and I ended up doing it. And I loved the 4 way And I, you know, it took one assistant coach to tell me, to run every day and that was it like I was just running every day and then let's see so then I didn't plan on running in college I like got one of those I went to Case Western Reserve University for their music program um and I saw that there was um you know they they sent out like a little questionnaire of like what what other extracurriculars would you like to do and um I filled out that maybe I'd like to do cross country or track um nobody ever contacted me but during freshman orientation, I ran down to the gym to, just to check it out because I've always been kind of, I don't know, I think they're fun. I <laughs> think gyms are fun. Um, and so I went to check it out, and uh, my coach was looking out her window, which happened to overlook, like, the sidewalk into the building. And she saw me running in and went and found me in the cardio room. And as I was coming off the treadmill, she was like, um, Esther. Or she didn't, she didn't know my name. She said, um, you look like a runner. And I was like, uh, thanks. <laughs> and she said, well, are you interested in running cross country? And I was like, well, I was thinking about doing track, but at this point, cross country seems kind of late, you know? And she said, well, let's just go get you a physical just in case. And then that became the beginning of my college career. I ended up being dead last at our conference meet that first season of cross country, which is my first season of cross country yeah. ever. I think I was fifth to last in our conference meet. And I was obviously not that successful right off the bat <laughs> in, in longer distances. I think my PR freshman year was, I know it was 2149 for cross country 5k. And then I got a little bit more serious because I was convinced I was an 800 runner. Um, and I started training like 50 to 60 miles a week in indoor and outdoor. Um, and then I think I ran 223 for the 800 and like, um, I don't know, 501 or maybe just under five minutes for the 15. And then coach threw me into a 5K at the end of the season because I didn't even make our conference team. Um, or maybe I did, but it was just like B heat, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for Division three. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> um, and, and then I... Uh, coach threw me into a 5K after the season was over, and I ran 18.45 or something. Okay. So yeah. it was like, oh, three minutes off your cross-country PR. Yeah. Like, and I think Coach told me after that, she was like, you're never running the 800 again. <laughs> and she was tr – that she held to her word. I think I only ever ran, like, in a 4 by 8 after that, a few times in conference. And after that, though, I was um, – had a rough summer because I was anemic, but I was still running uh, 40 miles a week. My iron got down to – by the time we tested it, it was 7. My ferritin yeah. was 7. Yeah. And my hemoglobin was, I think, right under 10. Mm, and it doesn't feel too good. <laughs> no, I had a bunch of doctors look at my stats, and they were like, wait, how are you even getting up out of bed? Like, yeah. This is insane. Um, and so much less running 40 miles a week, and I was literally running like half a mile at a time and – it was miserable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so after th talking to three doctors who I each told, like, I think my iron might be low. Yeah. And each of them responded with, oh, I wouldn't mess with that if I were you. I finally, like, came back to campus in August, and um, we did a two-mile time trial, and I think I ran I, I ran 1350. Mm-hmm. Yep. For a two-mile time trial, and it was all I could do to even keep running for two miles. Yeah. And I was completely beat yeah. afterwards. And my coach said, you're going to the trainers right now, 
and you're going to tell them to give you some blood work to get your t- iron <laughs> tested, yeah. which is great. Like, she didn't just tell me, like, you need to take iron, you know. No, like she, yeah. she made sure she went through all the steps and said, okay, get tested, find out what's wrong, because um, I know what's wrong, but mm-hmm. we need numbers. Um, and so I got my iron tested, obviously, and, well... First, I went to the trainers, and they looked at me, and they were like, are you sure you didn't just not train enough over the summer? <laughs> and I just about lost it. <laughs> um, but then my coach came in. I called my coach. I was in tears, and coach came in and wagged her finger in front of the trainer and was like, no, listen, this is my top athlete. Yeah. You need to treat her like yeah. that. <laughs> and I'm sure she knew, like, you wouldn't go slack No, off. I yeah. was not a slacker. Yeah. And so um, that second meet, I... So the first meet, I was, like, maybe fifth or sixth on the team. Second meet, I was our top finisher. And basically, from then on, I was the top runner at Case and mm-hmm. ended up being – I qualified for nationals that season and then every season, so all nine seasons until I graduated. Wow. Okay. Um, and I was a six-time All-American. Had a few hiccups at nationals where – including the first time especially that I went. Um, a few hiccups where I ended up – having what I now see as, like, a anxiety attack, mm, okay. um, where I actually lost vision. Like, I wow. couldn't really – I think I was hyperventilating, um, and I just super underperformed, and it was because of my nerves, obviously. Like, I was really nervous and took things a little bit too seriously, and part of it was, like, lack of exposure to – quality um competition Mm -hmm. or like that much competition during the regular season so when I finally got into a race where I really had no chance of winning it was a complete shock to my system and and I just panicked so it took me a while but I learned how to kind of deal with it learn some strategies part of that was with my coach and part of that was eventually with a sports psychologist my senior year and then also, a big part of it was learning cognitive science mm-hmm. and as my second major, which I started my junior year um, because it became a major my junior year at Case. And that also was really helpful. Interesting. So, so what were some of the strategies that you employed to cope with your anxiety going into these races? So one of the first ones that really worked for me um, was I basically, so in Division three or Division, any division, um, All-American is top eight. Okay. And so I basically decided, okay, once I had been to nationals three or four times, I kind of knew who were the top people. And luckily, I was in a really good conference. Um, the UAA is a really great conference. And so the girls from Emory and Wash U and mm-hmm. Brandeis and NYU would be in the race with me. Um, and so I knew a bunch of faces and I knew who I should beat. Like mm-hmm. these people, these are people I had no problem beating yeah. at conference because yeah. I knew I could win that race. But when it came to nationals, it was like I just got so overwhelmed. So I kind of broke it down to the people I knew mm-hmm. and just kind of only focused on five people in the race. Okay. I would focus on two who I knew I could beat, like one or two who I really should be right with the whole time. You, It's hard to – you can't focus on just one person because no. then that one person has a bad day or exactly. they have an excellent day and then you're just screwed. Yep. Um, so two people who I knew I should beat, two people who I should be with, and one person who is like kind of a goal, like I should really – like, if, if everything goes perfectly, I would beat that one person. And that was a technique that I've actually taken with me and continued to do. Like, now that when I first started running post-collegiately in the U.S., like, I had a hard time with that because I really didn't know anybody. And it, mm-hmm. I mean, coming from Division three, there was nobody who I knew from college who was running. And mm-hmm. everybody was a lot older than me and um, more experienced and all Division one runners. And so I was completely fish out of water. But then once I started to figure out people and knew kind of where my place was, um, I definitely had a lot more confidence building that kind of five-person group. Exactly. I think that's yeah. a great a great strategy that anybody can use, too. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure you have – you've got clients that you coach. Do you ever mm-hmm. advise that they do the same in their races? Yeah. So another thing – another way to – because often, like, if you're going to – if you live in – South Carolina, and you're going to the Chicago Marathon, you're not going to know who's going to be no, around you. No. Like, there's no way. <laughs> Granted, if you go to, like, a local 5K, you're going to know exactly. most, most yeah. of who's going to be there. So that strategy can work. But another strategy that can work in a completely foreign environment 
and which I actually used at the World Championships in 2015, is because obviously, like, I knew two people. They were the U.S. runners, and both of them started way ahead of me. So, you know, <laughs> if I didn't have any kind of backup there, I'd, you know, just be lost. But really, it's about kind of running your own race and being within yourself or, you know, following a plan through a certain point in the race, like for a marathon, maybe through 10 miles or 11 miles and sticking to your plan. And then at that point, you know, maybe at 20 miles in the race, not everything kind of changes at 20 miles in, mm-hmm. in a marathon. So people could be really moving backwards in a way that that's unusual for like a 5k or 10k. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, pick a point in the race where you decide, okay, now the people around me at this point, those are the people I'm racing. That's my Mm, race. Okay. And if I beat all the people around me or that person in front of me who's in front of me right now, that's me winning the race. Okay. So, like, creating a race inside where you are, like, you're a little bubble at some point in the race as opposed to thinking about the people who are winning the race. Yeah. Because they might be minutes ahead of you or hours ahead of you depending on who you are. So, you know, Thinking about the whole race can just be super overwhelming. So that's a way to apply that same kind yeah, of concept. Yeah, just running any, your own race. Okay. Running your own race to a certain point. Maybe it's if it's a 5K, you know, run that first mile mm-hmm. the way you know you're supposed to run that first mile. And then pick the people around you as like, okay, these are my competition now. Yeah, just kind of gauge yeah. off those people. I think mm-hmm. that's a great idea. So Esther, you, you started as an aspiring 800-meter runner and you – quickly realized your strengths lied more in the longer distances. So how did you become interested in the marathon? What really sparked your passion for that distance in particular? So first off, the marathon is the weakest event to qualify for Mm -hmm. the Olympic trials uh, because they can actually accept up to 200 people um, because there's no limitation on Mm -hmm. the track or anything. So that was part of the motivation was like, I knew that I could qualify for the marathon or at a certain point in my career, I knew that it was possible. Um, and that day that I was really certain was uh, the day after conference, my senior year. Our conference was always around the time of the New York City Marathon. Oh, okay. And we came back from Boston. I had won the conference fairly easily. And we came back from Boston, and the next day, like, I would always go to church on Sundays because um, I was a paid singer. I was a music major. And... Uh, then I came back from church and I took a little break, ate some lunch or whatever, and watched the recap of the New York City Marathon. Mm -hmm. And that was the day that Paula Radcliffe raced Gitiwami. And it was this, like, epic race of the super moms. And, like, (laughs) they were both new moms. And I think Giti had, like, a, a first child before this one. So, like, they were just both incredible women. And I was super motivated, so, and also I was, like, a little, I don't know why I was upset about conference, like, I was upset that I hadn't gotten the conference record, because I knew I could have, and I went out in, like, a seven-minute mile, because I was just being a wimp, you know, (laughs) Um, and I knew that I was just testing the water to see how much, like, how much control I had over the race, Yeah. so anyway, I was, like, a little bit lackluster about my performance at, um, at conference, and so I ended up Um, going out for a really hard long run. Um, And I remember I measured it out on GMAPs afterwards, and it was 15.23 miles, I believe. And my average pace was 623 pace. And at that time, the qualifying time for the marathon was 247, I think. Yeah, 247. It was 247, Mm -hmm. so under 247. And so I figured out the, the pace actually was really close to what I just run for mm-hmm. like a 15 mile long run the day after a hard race and well relatively relatively boost. hard race but yeah and the way I ran it like I finished with you know I think at least my last mile was under six minutes yeah and, you know I realized that there's especially at that time because distance running has had a re- revival since then mm-hmm. or it's just been on the up and up That at that time, like, I could have won a lot of half marathons around the country with just any portion of that long run I just done. So that was when I kind of knew that I was definitely going to be, I was destined to be a marathoner. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) And um, I was really looking forward to it. and, And then by the time I, by April, I knew that I was going to be living in Vienna after college. 
And the day I found out, I signed up for the Berlin Marathon, which was still okay. possible at that point. I don't know how that, like, yeah. six months out, you could just sign up. Yeah, you know? And it was actually pretty now. cheap. It wasn't, Gosh, like, yeah, it wasn't. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very expensive. And I had, um, one of my college roommates was going to be living in Berlin, so it was just a no-brainer. Like, I went to yeah, stay with so her. Perfect. Yeah, mm-hmm. And I had another close friend from high school who was living there as well. So, yeah, it ended up, I went to Berlin, and it was absolutely perfect weather. It was a... A world record day. Uh, Gabriel Selassie set the record second time in 2008. And I ended up running dead even splits. I think it was 123.03 and 123.15. Wow. <laughs> That's yeah. impressive. Um, so that added up. Or, you know, 123.12. So it added up to 246.15. Wow. That's quite a debut. Yeah. yeah. So I was really pleased with it. I was like kind of, I remember crying after I vomited after the line, <laughs> you know, like um, I was, I wore Nike Pegasus and I like came to a full and complete stop at every water stop because I was just like a friend of mine had told me to make sure you get fluids and I hadn't practiced yeah, ever taking yeah. fluids on a course before. So I was just like, okay. What's most important is I'll stop and, and get that. So, yeah, in Berlin, I, I came across the line, and I knew that that was, you know, had I run that time a year before, I would have qualified for the Olympic trials yeah. because it would have been in the window for the 2008 trials. So um, I knew at that point that I kind of had to qualify for 2012, and and that would become my goal, but the window didn't open until the beginning of 2010, so January okay. 1st, 2010. And so I had a year to kind of get out of shape, and that's what I basically did that first year in Vienna. I just ran easy miles the whole time, and then I ended up getting out of shape again because I was, again, like in a foreign country and dealing with other things and having a great time. But I think that year ended up being really good for me kind of in the bigger picture of things because it allowed me to kind of reset and not do any speed work and really enjoy easy running Definitely. in a way that I hadn't really been able to enjoy mm-hmm. while I was in college. Just kind of hit the reset button. Absolutely. Um, so then the second year, though, I started working with my coach, Terrence Shea, and he just gave me basically like a two six-week plans, and I ended up following them and, and ran a 239 for my – third marathon. There's one in there that we will talk about. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> yeah. So uh, at that point, I qualified for the trials and also for ZAP. And um, that was truly one of the best races of my life and most fulfilling. And um, I am still actually prouder of that race than all but maybe two other races in my life. So, yeah. 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 So would you consider that one to be kind of a defining race in your career or something that you look back on that kind of change the course of your career absolutely like that that was the day that was the moment um and that was a negative split race where my terry had told me that i could go 242 and i was like floored by that because really we've been targeting like 615 pace for all my workouts that's amazing so out of nowhere i ran 605 pace yeah And, and what did what did you credit that to? Like, did you just bring your A game that day? Just um, have your day of days? It was absolutely perfect conditions. Mm-hmm. It was like 39 degrees or something. And um, this was in Seville. It was, you know, a great course. I found a nice little pack that took me under their wing, a little of men. They were excited to help me. And it was, it was really great to have them. I don't really remember if any of them spoke English, but I <laughs> definitely felt a lot of camaraderie there. And it was, I don't know, I just, I was ready to go. And it was funny because I went through the halfway at one twenty thirty, And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm already, <laughs> you know, I'm 30 seconds under what he said. Yeah. I should be going like what I should actually finish in. And that's insane. Like I feel really good. And I started to panic and then I, I would stop myself and I was like, but body, how do you feel? You know, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and like That's body, the and body said, I feel great. Yeah. Um, and it was like, it was, you know, that's, that's actually something that I've also taken with me and continued to really ask that question on a very regular basis during training and, and workouts and races, making sure that I stay in touch with like how my body actually feels as opposed to like imposing from my brain on my body, like how this should feel. Like if you're running really fast and you think it should hurt, then 
of course it's going to hurt. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But if you just listen to your body and say, hey, is, does this feel like 10K pace? You know, is this the right kind of hurt? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Then that's a better question as opposed to saying like, this should hurt or, you know, this will hurt. You know, I, I've always kind of shied away from that kind of thing. It always makes me a little bit too nervous to think of things in that way. I feel like that's a good thing. I think when you consider how rarely our race plans go exactly as we intend them to go, it's it's good to leave a, bit of, a little bit of wiggle room and have some backup plans going into a race. So I think that's that's a good piece of advice right there. So... Esther, you you talked about your first marathon, your third marathon. (laughs) So we'll talk about the second one. I've heard this story before, and I think it's a great story. From what I remember, you consider this to be the worst race you've ever had, but you took away quite a lot from that race. So can you tell us a little bit about what this race entailed and what you learned from that race that day? So uh, like I mentioned, that's first year in Vienna, I was training with like a good friend. I had, I had a great training partner. Um, but we just basically ran seven to seven thirty pace every day and there were no workouts and there was like really no preparation. He'd never run that much before. So it was great for him and he'd never run that fast before on a regular basis. So that was also great for him. And he was also a man. And so he Slight advantage. <laughs> benefited from that training a lot more than I did. Um, and uh, we got to race day and it was a little too warm for me. I think I was dehydrated probably going into it. I really just didn't take it as seriously as I would have if I had really done the training. Mm-hmm. So combined with the lack of training and the lack of seriousness, I ended up dehydrating by about 15, maybe 20 K. Wow. So yeah. that was very early on. Um, and the way that I knew something was wrong was every time I took any kind of fluids, it went straight through me. And I've never urinated on a run in any other circumstances. So it was like, whoa, what is happening to me? So was that a product of the dehydration? Or I think so. Yeah. I mean, I really have never totally nailed it down, but it was hot. I mean, it was a, it was a sunny, warm day. And then... By 25, I was just, like, counting the Ks and being like, I'll drop out at the next one. I'll drop out at the next one. I mean, really, honestly, probably at 20K, I was already thinking that. Well, because we went through 21K in the the Vienna – I was the Vienna Marathon. And the Vienna course, I was with the winning woman for the half marathon Mm -hmm. at that point. And she went off to the half marathon (laughs) finish. And I was like, oh, crap. Oh, man. That's so tempting. And actually, I talked to somebody recently who said – like just this last weekend, she told me that the second half of Vienna is way harder. And I have run, uh, I also ended up running the next year a half marathon PR on the first half of the marathon. So like, Gosh, I know wow. that the first half is not bad. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was very um, satisfying, kind of a relief to hear her say that the second half is really hard because that was definitely my experience. <laughs> um, I don't think the course is that hard because I ran all around Vienna all the time. But I think a, a lot of it is, like, psychologically hard because mm-hmm. you're going out and back. And Oh, yeah. Um, and for me, it was psychologically really hard to run in a city that I knew so well. Yeah. Um, I had run everywhere around that city. And you knew how far it was. I think it's it so much to harder to run. Yeah. yeah, it's so much harder to run uh, where you actually know. I think yeah. so, too, yeah. Um, you, just, you know all the distances, so it's, exactly. it's hard to – to be conscious of that during a marathon, I Yeah, think. because, like, if you're running a route that usually takes you 50 minutes and you're yeah. supposed to cover it in 35, yeah. then you're like, it's a little ah. <laughs> but if you just know I have 35 minutes until this mark because that's what the course is, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and you're in some – you don't know really where you are. You don't know any of the, like, landmarks mm-hmm. or anything. Then it's a lot easier to kind of just – stick to the plan. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was another thing I took away was, uh, don't run a marathon at home <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unless you're like, you know, able to really zone out and yeah. kind of not focus on the, the scenery and just pretend like you're somewhere else. Um, or maybe it helps you. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm at the exception. So let's see. Yeah. I mean, I guess I just learned my limits that like, so I ended up at 30 K I went across the mats and I stepped off the course and sat down and had a little pity fest and then (laughs) um, started walking back towards the finish area, which was then I realized it's going to be at least 10K. Yeah. Because like it wasn't that much more before the turnaround and then 
So I was, there's no way I was going to be walking six miles at that point. And there was also like, I had family members waiting for me and I couldn't drop out. So I started walking and then I was like, I started jogging a little bit towards the finish line. Cause I was like, this is going to take forever. And then I heard this voice over the, the like PA. I don't know where they had it or like <laughs> how I heard it. Cause there's not really any kind of speaker system in the Prater. And I heard him say in German, like, come on ladies, like four out of the top 16 women have already dropped out. Like, come on, just have fun. Like the rest of us. <laughs> and I was like, you are so right. I was turning 23 the next day and I was like, okay, I need to just buck up and be an adult. Yeah. And, not pretend like my pride is that important. Who cares what yeah. number is associated with my name? You know, like it turned out that I got back in the race and I, I basically jog walked with a smile on my face to the finish the last 12K, even though I was like pretty miserable. But, you know, it wasn't as bad when I wasn't like actually pushing myself, mm -hmm. um, the dehydration at least. And I think my body did relax a little bit. So I made it to the finish line. I don't, I never got past. In the seven That's minutes remarkable. that wow. I wasn't running. Yeah. <laughs> I never Everybody got else passed. was struggling too, probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was it was warm. Yeah. Um, but also the women's field was not very deep. And mm -hmm. so like even so I I think I went from like two I don't know, two thirty, I think, through thirty K, something like that. And then it took me a long time to get to the finish. It took me thirty nine minutes to cover twelve K. Yeah. Is that right? That'd be pretty good, know. actually. That would actually be pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, mine. I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't remember exactly. Maybe it's it was. Maybe it was. Maybe it was two twenty. Yeah, yeah, that sounds. That right. sounds more right. Yeah. Um, because I was about seven minute pace. Uh, I was I was on track for like better than two fifty five, mm -hmm. and I ended up running three oh nine. So that was pretty good under the circumstances. You know, yeah. Like, it sounds like you took away. Some lessons that really helped shape your career, lessons that you wouldn't have learned in a great race. So there were clearly some positives to be had from a not so great day. So, and I, you know, I was able to smile and people were impressed by that. Yeah. And I went back to work the next day and people were like, oh my gosh, you were 12 at the Vienna <laughs> Marathon. That's amazing. Puts things in and perspective. And I'm like, you have no idea. I ran 30 minutes slower than that. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the next year I ran 30 minutes faster than that. So yeah, it was, well, I think you have to nice have to those races so that the races that you actually, you know, you achieve what you've set out to do are, are that much sweeter. So yeah, nobody ever has like a totally perfect score when it comes to, like, no, all especially in marathons. running. No, yeah. certainly not. Yeah. When we come back, Esther will share with us her tips on how to bounce back from bad races as well as how to avoid the pitfalls of comparing ourselves to others. This is Sinead Hockey, and you're listening to Run to the Top at Runners Connect. While we runners usually practice good, nutrient-dense diets, most of us lack the amino acids needed to break down and process the proteins we consume. This is bad news for both recovery and muscle growth, not to mention a ton of other vital life processes. That's why Body Health created Perfect Amino, the perfect blend of the eight essential amino acids to help you build your muscles, expedite recovery, and nab that next personal record. I take Perfect Amino tablets every day and mix the Perfect Amino XP powder in my post-workout smoothies for extended protein absorption. This has helped me work harder and reach new levels in my running, something so important to the body health team that if you place in your age group at any public racing event, they'll put you in their winner's circle and send you a free bottle of Perfect Amino. Check it out at runnersconnect.net forward slash winner circle to learn more. And don't forget to use coupon code RUNNERSCONNECT on your next purchase. That's RUNNERSCONNECT in all caps. Make sure to also visit runnersconnect.net forward slash body health where you can enter to win a six-pack of Perfect Amino worth $230. Again, that's runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. I wish you the best of luck. 
When I started using gels to fuel during my long runs and workouts, I'll be honest, I couldn't find one that I didn't hate having to take. All the gels I tried were either too sweet or too thick, making them hard to consume without chasing them down with gulps and gulps of water. They also seemed to be giving me all sorts of GI issues, which obviously made long runs and workouts a lot harder than they needed to be, but even more importantly, I felt like they were impacting my overall health. That is until I discovered Excel Gel by Pacific Health Labs. Unlike most gels, Excel Gel has a thin consistency that makes it easy to take while running, and it's also all natural, completely free of gluten and preservatives you just don't need. It's also the only gel on the market that has the proven 4 to 1 ratio of carbs to protein, as well as a mix of carbohydrates to smooth glucose uptake and extend endurance. Excel Gel helps me get the most out of my long runs and workouts, and I absolutely love it, especially the raspberry cream flavor with caffeine. Right now, Pacific Health is offering all Run to the Top listeners free samples of Excel Gel. All you have to do is send an email to info at pacifichealthlabs.com with the subject line, Run to the Top. Then simply request your Excel Gel samples, as well as the address you'd like them mailed to, and then you can try them for yourself for free. Again, that's info at pacifichealthlabs.com. If you want to check out more of Pacific Health's great products, you can do so at runnersconnect.net forward slash Pacific Health. We are back with Esther Atkins. And Esther, we've talked about bad races and mediocre races. How do you bounce back from these? How do you pick yourself up and dust yourself off after a bad race? Can you give our listeners any any tips as to how to process these and, and move on afterwards? Uh, so another example of a bad race um, that was actually really hard for me to handle and, and bounce back from, and honestly it took me like six months or something, was I ran a track 5K while I was at Zap at the Raleigh Relays. And my PR going into that race was 16.58 from college and somehow I was just convinced that I was supposed to run 1620 and because that was the standard for zap and mm-hmm. you know like I figured oh well I have an a standard so I should be able to hit all the standards yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I went and ran the race and I ran 1645 so it was a 13 second PR and I was devastated like, yeah I was inconsolable I was sobbing on this I just remember sitting on this like behind the stands on the ground sobbing and it took me a really long time but eventually I kind of figured out oh wait you're just not a 5k runner (laughs) and that's okay like and actually uh it's it's been a huge relief because a lot of people don't understand me like they're like wait how did Esther run so fast in that marathon like I beat her like hands down in any 10k or you know yeah yeah or 10 mile race or half marathon, you know, like no- nothing that I, nothing else I do translates to my marathon. And that was really frustrating for me for yeah. a long time because I just felt like I I had made so much progress in the marathon. Well, therefore, you know, my first marathon translated fairly closely to my 35, 45, 10K, you know, yeah. like it wasn't a huge like discrepancy in mm-hmm. terms of fitness, but then as I got so much better at the marathon, I was like, oh, well, all my other times are going to get so much faster. And um, it just didn't happen that way. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, it's it's actually really great because it means that I can show up to local road races and, and be really challenged yeah. and get my butt kicked sometimes by other women. And that's okay. Yeah. Like um, I've learned be- to have confidence like through my success in the marathon. I've learned to have confidence that you – really can't be good at everything. No. Some people are and you know good for them, but <laughs> like um, they're few and far between though. I feel like yeah. everybody's got their own strengths and you got to figure out right. how to play to yours. I so. think it really is more about being grateful for what I have instead yeah. of instead of focusing on what I don't. Yeah, I feel like that's a good rule of thumb for any runner out there. I feel like we've we've covered the bad enough. Let's talk about the good now. Esther, what has been one of your proudest accomplishments to date? Honestly, the Seville Marathon was one of those huge yeah. breakthroughs yeah. Um, because I ended up running the second half, I think it was 119.15, I think, in order to... Yeah, 119.15. So, That's pretty impressive. <laughs> which my 
half marathon PR at the time was 118.55. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Again, like much better at the marathon than yeah. anything else. Yeah. Um, just like the Energizer Bunny, just, you know, you just keep, keep going. Just um, get into a pace. I know that the there. ultras are in my future, but it's just a matter of time. Yeah. And whether or not I run out of it before I get there. <laughs> you know? um, so I. Yeah, that's one of the top ones. Obviously, winning the U.S. Championship was a huge career-changing mm-hmm. event for me. Um, I feel incredibly grateful that I was able to, like, I really targeted making that world team. And, you know, I knew that I would have an opportunity at the Twin Cities Marathon. And the fact that I was able to go out there and get it done, especially since, you know, I was so far back from the leaders for at some points in the race, I was like 90 seconds back from the leaders and to have the confidence to still be able to not only, you know, catch up and take a potty break and then yeah. catch up some more, you know, like, um, I, w- I really look at my confidence that day is like, that was a peak moment in my career. Yeah. Since then, I've been having a lot of fun and I know that my place in the running world is more established not really, but like, you know, as, as where I am, you know, not anything better than I actually am, but people kind of know. And, and I don't know, I, I, it's, it's always been a mission of mine, at least since, since I lived in Vienna, especially since there really weren't as many female runners in Vienna, it became a mission of mine to make running look fun. Mm, And, uh, it's really great to be able to kind of be at a relatively high level and still make running look fun because yeah. often I'm one of the first people who comes through in a marathon who actually has a smile on her face. And <laughs> most people don't look like they're having fun. No, no. <laughs> um, and that's okay. I'm not, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I, for some reason, I put that upon myself to be an ambassador for the sport mm-hmm. and show, show people that you can run hard and it doesn't have to be miserable. Like it might hurt. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be miserable. Yeah. Like, those are two different things. Definitely. And at the end of the day, every runner needs to be doing this because they enjoy it. And a lot of the times, I feel like we runners tend to fall into the trap of looking at running as a means to an end. We we focus on the outcome more than the process. And if you're in this for the long haul, it's it's really important to enjoy the process. And Esther, you've always had some really great insight to share on this front as well. So can you share with our listeners your tips for enjoying every day for what it is and and really just being patient with the process? Yeah, I think a lot of us get wrapped up into like forcing things Mm -hmm. in our training and in our racing. Like you think that you just like that 5k that I ran on the track, you know, I thought I should be able to do something. So therefore I was trying to just force it Mm -hmm. and that ends up being really miserable and nobody really has fun doing that so I've learned how to kind of let each day be what it is and really part of that approach a major part of that approach has been uh looking at it as each day is just kind of a checkbox like Mm. did you do what was on the assignment you know if you have a coach then did you do what your coach said, or did you do the best version of that that you can do today? Because sometimes, you know, it's 85% humidity and 95 degrees, you know, like you just can't do anything. I mean, that, that really happens, but, (laughs) um, (laughs) that's specifically, but you know, like, uh, conditions can be really bad and, or maybe you worked really late last night, or maybe you're just exhausted from travel or whatever it is. Like, as long as you're actually putting the effort in, then you can, check the box yeah, and just move on instead of dwelling on a workout. And I think that has – part of it is the success I've had gives me the luxury of having more confidence mm. and knowing that, like, I have figured it out to a certain extent and what I've been doing has been working. So, therefore, I don't need to stress out yeah, about clearly. whether or not I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, And I understand that that's not where I've always been. And, and as soon as things start to go out of control and, like, you know, not – not be what I want them to be at all, then uh, of course I'll start to kind of Mm. revert back to like, you know, being a little bit more anal about everything being perfect. Yeah. I think most runners are kind of type A personalities. Yeah. You know, I think everybody can probably relate to that. At the same time, I mean, again, being grateful for what I have Mm -hmm. and the experiences and the successes that I've already had, nobody can take them away from me. No. And, 
you know, as I've become an older runner, I probably won't run PRs anymore, you know, like, and that's just how it is. But one of the pieces of advice that I really value from when I um, was looking at groups back in 2010, when I qualified for the trials and I was looking for where I was going to actually train for those trials, the Hansons brothers, I can't remember which one, was talking about this mantra that he had, which was start where you are. Mm, and I think I like it's, I, he had it from some movie, but I think it's, that's definitely a good one to kind of come back to because we all get wrapped up in like that imaginary trajectory that you have that you start to make, especially in this first year or so of running where you're like, oh my gosh, I've taken three minutes of my 5K. If <laughs> yeah. I just take three more, you know, like, <laughs> which is impossible. It's right? progressively harder to exactly. take time off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think we, we build these imaginary trajectories and then we compare ourselves to them forever yeah, and it's yeah. just not fair. No. So instead, forget about that. Just look at, okay, where was I yesterday? Where, where am I today? You know, if yesterday was hard, then today is easy. If yesterday was easy, then I can do better today than mm-hmm. I did yesterday, you know, or if last week's workout went terribly then that gives me an opportunity to do better this week yeah, you know yeah. or if last week's workout went great then maybe I can keep it going or maybe I'll be about the same yeah. maybe I'll be a little bit worse because yes last week was great you know yeah, yeah. um and just kind of stay in the moment as opposed to comparing to like who you were or who you thought you should be by now mm-hmm. I like that I think for pretty much every runner if you were to look at our career as a line graph we, we ideally, we want that straight upward uh, trajectory, but in reality, it's, it's more of a roller coaster. So I yep. think accepting that is definitely important. So that's a great uh, piece of advice, especially for our listeners, it's just kind of, you know, enjoying the process. I do think it's important not to get so worked up about the outcome. And so when it comes to setting long-term and short-term goals, what you, you were talking about checking boxes off every day. What do you do when it comes to like setting goals? What advice can you give our listeners on that front? Um, so I actually taught or I was like working at a um, – I didn't teach at all. I was, I was just a helper <laughs> <laughs> at uh, the Princeton camp, the Princeton girls running camp. And that was really fun. They have like a little goal setting thing. And I've also, you know – I've read some other people's opinions about how to, you know, set goals. And and I definitely agree that setting attainable goals is the number one priority. Mm -hmm. It's great to dream big, but goal a little bit smaller. (laughs) um, I think it's great to have, like, long-term big goals, but you can't necessarily always keep that in mind because that's that can sometimes be a little bit too far off. Mm -hmm. So having intermediary or like intermediate goals, which is like you could go, uh, I mean, giving yourself t- daily tasks mm-hmm. that you believe are going to help you achieve that goal. So for instance, um, for this last Boston marathon, I wanted to meditate every day. I did core, like at least just a tiny bit of core every day. Mm-hmm. And I had like a bedtime of 11 o'clock, lights out. I think that's pretty much it. Those are the things I actually held to. Yeah. But having those things so that I know, like, even if training isn't going perfectly, even if nothing else is going the way I want it to, at least I can kind of say, okay, I am doing these things and these things are going to help me be better. So picking a few things that you can control to focus on and kind of stick to and kind of have that steadiness. Absolutely. And I think writing them down and maybe taping them on your bathroom mirror can, can kind of keep yeah, you accountable. It's a good way to, sure. to check them off. All right. So that's that's a great piece of advice. So Esther, one one last real question I'll ask you is about, about comparison. But with like anything else in our lives, sometimes we can fall into the trap of comparing ourselves to others and running is certainly no exception to that. And while it's good to have goals and and maybe even aspire to be like someone else, it is easy to fall into this trap of this comparison game. And so, Esther, how how do you advise our listeners and runners really just focus on themselves and focus on bettering themselves and kind of leave everything else out of the equation? Yeah, so I had a really close friend who I noticed over time – 
Like this is just kind of one of those examples for me of that moment where I realized, okay, she's right. Um, <laughs> where I noticed over time that we ate very differently. Mm-hmm. And I felt like somehow like I was inferior because she was running so much faster than me. And maybe like I needed to eat exactly what she was eating or, you know, exactly when she was eating the same portions and everything. Like I wanted to, part of me was drawn to changing everything, but the other part of me was like, no, that doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. And so I was really conflicted about it and I didn't really have a whole lot of help outside of uh, myself because I wasn't really talking to anybody about it. And, you know, like I just... uh, it just ate me up every time because we ate together all the time. Mm-hmm. So it was like I was always just looking at her plate and watching her eat and thinking to myself, well, what a what a loser am I because I'm <laughs> not eating that, you know, like and I'm, and I'm running so much slower than her. So therefore, like I must be doing it wrong. And I finally confronted her about it. And I'm really grateful that I did because she <laughs> I was in tears because I was just like it had just bubbled over, you know, and. I finally said something and I was like, you know, I, I feel like I'm just not eating right um, because you eat so differently from me. And she said to me, Esther, just pay attention to your own plate. Mm-hmm. And that was a really important reminder. Yeah, and I think it's, yep. you know, a coach that I worked with at Ryder, Bob Hamer, he's the head coach there. He had his own version of it from yoga class, which was like, Focus on your own mat Mm -hmm. and your own practice. And I think that's – it's so important to happiness. The the key to happiness is not comparing yourself. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, to to anybody else. And um, maybe you can – like I like when I first started running and what made me fall in love with with running in the first place, like comparing yourself to yourself, that that can be really fun except for when you start comparing yourself to your former self Mm -hmm. and not your current self. Yep. Because if you get farther away, then maybe you were way fitter then or maybe you had an injury just recently and so you're just coming back from that. Um, And so if you continue to compare yourself to that former self that was like super fit, then you're going to be miserable. Yeah, (laughs) But if you compare yourself to that former self who was in the middle of an injury and say, oh my gosh, now I can actually run. Yeah. What a wonderful thing, (laughs) you know, like comparing to the most immediate version of yourself, I think can be helpful. It can suck when you just got injured and you were really fit and then <laughs> yesterday I could run and now I can't. That then then it's the hardest thing and then you just need to start uh, binge watching something mm. on Netflix. Yep, yep, I agree. <laughs> I think so. Or just delve into something else, like yeah. focus on your work or something, you know, like cuz there's nothing you can do yeah. to to heal that faster. Just I know. think that's a good solution for the runner blues as well as to have make sure you're not putting all your eggs into the running basket mm-hmm. have different outlets and different passions Definitely. so that's a great great piece of advice and there. even when you're in the best shape of your life sometimes it's really helpful to have something else on the side to keep you yeah. from obsessing about yeah. it yeah yeah you know getting too wrapped up in it um it can definitely help to at least have a little bit of distraction whether you had a great workout or you had you know a terrible workout like just taking your mind off of it sometimes can be really helpful yeah Yeah, and it it just makes life more enjoyable, so it's a great piece of advice. So one more question, Esther. You you obviously run for Skechers, and, you know, you've you've got some big, pretty big goals ahead. So what's on tap for you next in terms of your own racing and and Skechers? So I actually, it's a little bit up in the air, but I'm definitely doing a fall marathon, and the very next race that I have is definitely going to be the Club Champs in Central Park for New York Roadrunners club champs, I guess. There's a five mile. Then I'll be running, representing New York AC. Ooh, okay. Nice. Um, and I won that race last year, so maybe I can repeat. Yeah. Well, we will link that race below so people can check that out. Maybe maybe some uh, New Yorkers can come cheer you on or yeah, you maybe. jump in the race. <laughs> or, so, yeah, if they belong to a club, then they can come run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll link that below. And Esther, will also link below your, your Twitter and your blog so people can uh, keep up with you. But Thank you so much for joining us today yeah, and, and all, your, all your great insight for us today. Thank you. <laughs> As Esther mentioned, she strives not only to push herself to be the very best that she can be in running, but she also revels in helping others do the same. She is a true ambassador of the sport, 
and I'm excited to see what's next for her. If you want to keep up with Esther's progress, check out the links below for her Twitter account and blog, where she also offers personal consultations. So if you listened to last week's episode, you're probably a little bit surprised to find we weren't speaking with sports nutritionist Dr. Louise Burke today. As head of discipline in sports nutrition for the Australian Institute of Sport, Louise has been, as she put it, up to her armpits in meetings and workshops these past few weeks. We've rescheduled and you'll get to hear from her in a couple weeks, so be sure to keep a lookout for that interview. In the meantime, next week we're in for a pretty inspiring interview with two very special guests. Their names are Adam Goucher and Tim Catalano, and together they make up the founders of Run the Edge, a company based in Boulder, Colorado, that specializes in bringing health and fitness inspiration, training, and motivation to the running community. Adam and Tim competed together at the University of Colorado, and as you may know, Adam went on to become an Olympian shortly thereafter. With their combined experience competing on the roads and track, and Tim's expertise in sports psychology, the two make for a pretty powerful duo with lots of great insight on the mental side of our sport. I had such a fun time interviewing them and think you will really enjoy this episode, so be sure to check it out next week. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast and that it provided you some perspective that helps you and your running. I'm actually taking care of Esther's dog, Grace, while she's out of town and Grace has been not so patiently waiting for me to take her on a run, so I'm off to do that. I hope you have a fantastic run today yourself, and that you tune in with me again next time. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 